So uh, thanks for sticking around for the second uh, video here about collaborating at scale, using and contributing to the Internet Storm Center. In uh, this video, we'll focus on the contributing part. How do you actually contribute your own logs uh, to the Internet Storm Center? In particular, how do you set up, uh, well, uh, one of those uh, Raspberry Pi honeypots here to actually uh, do that uh, for you? So that's uh, what this video will be about. Now, let's first talk a little bit about how it all fits uh, together and uh, how it's all being done. Hmm? Uh, so historically, and I go over this a little bit in the first video, we only took firewall logs, but and now we use Raspberry Pis and Ubuntu-based honeypots. The reason we pick those two again is they're cheap, they're easy. Also Raspberry Pi and Ubuntu are close enough, which allows us to sort of uh, maintain one piece of software that works on either platform. Some people prefer uh, the virtual machine approach uh, with Ubuntu over the physical Raspberry Pi, which depends on your network, you know, what's easier, what's uh, simpler uh, for you to do. And of course, uh, with uh, this honeypot approach, we don't just get firewall logs, we also get data from the honeypots, in particular Telnet SH, we're using Cowrie right now, and a web, uh, which uh, we use a little custom Python script uh, to collect uh, that uh, data. So the honeypot is designed to be a lightweight. Uh, there are more complex honeypots out there uh, that use multiple Docker images and such. We try to keep it as simple as possible. Yes, uh, with the latest Raspberry Pi, the Raspberry Pi 4, you essentially sort of have a gaming desktop uh, kind of at your uh, at your um, proposal here, but um, we try to still keep the software simple and light. It should work on a Pi Zero. Um, well, um, I test the, the Raspberry Pi 3, sort of my favorite platform. Four, you now need fans and such. I'm, I'm not really a big fan of the Pi 4, uh, but uh, if you pick a system to run it on, I highly recommend a wired uh, Ethernet interface. USB based can work like a little uh, USB Ethernet dongle, uh, but again, you know, the Raspberry Pi 3, what's it, B plus or whatever, um, does have a wired Ethernet port, which to me is sort of a big uh, selling point of that. Uh, yes, of course, Raspberry Pi uses SD cards, uh, these little uh, micro SD cards here as storage. Uh, we, we try to write as little kind of to disk as possible. Uh, to not uh, wear out uh, these cards. Mm -hmm. Yes, we don't want uh, the honeypot to get exploited, so uh, we are you trying to use like little Python scripts like Kauri and uh, our custom web-based script uh, to make it as safe as possible and also you know, uh, to maintain, to make it easy uh, to maintain uh, these honeypots. So from a security point of view, mm -hmm. There's very little attack surface. That's really what we try to do. The more isolated you can set up your honeypot, the better. I highly recommend that you're using a static IP address. So uh, in your router's DHCP configuration, set up a specific IP address for the honeypot. That'll make it uh, easier and safer to redirect ports uh, to the honeypot, which you will have to do. And, uh, let's uh, talk a little bit sort of about the overall architecture here. So this is your classic uh, home network. You have a uh, cable modem, DSL modem plugged into some kind of Wi-Fi router. I use the classic Linksys here. I'm not sure if they even still make that one, uh, but uh, probably everybody had one like that at some point or still uses it. And then the output here on uh, these uh, typical home routers, well, it's a switch, it's a four port switch. So there's no real isolation here between the different ports, uh, but we will have to expose the honeypot. And that's why it's important that the honeypot has a static IP address. So, you know, as the HCP addresses do get reassigned, that you're not by mistake exposing now one of your uh, workstations uh, to the outside internet. So yes, you have to expose the honeypot because the honeypot should see all unsolicited inbound traffic. So essentially you're not using your router as a firewall. You just tell the router, hey, there's a packet coming in, 
don't know where to send it to, send it to the honeypot. And most routers have a feature like that, like a DMC, a demilitarized zone port or an exposed host it's called. Sometimes you can set up port forwarding. Just forward all ports that you don't need for anything else uh, to the honeypot. In particular port 22 and 23, port 80 for a web 443, 8000. Those are kinds of ports you would like to send to the honeypot if at all possible. Now, if you have a little bit of a better firewall, and I put in here the Unify one, but I'm not advocating any vendors here. There are many similar ones out there. Open source, uh, PFSense, OpenSense can implement something like this, um, where you have a second LAN port. Like here, it's labeled WAN2, LAN2, because you can either configure it as like a failover WAN port or a secondary LAN. Well. Uh, now you have actually two isolated networks. And then just use one for your honeypot, one for the rest of your home network, and you're all good. And now you have a nice isolation, and that's of course a lot safer, a lot more secure. And like I said, if you have like one of those little firewall appliances with open sense and such, you can often add like a second um, port, opt to, it's often called in, in open sense and PF sense, and uh, direct it there. Now, the third option that's sort of popular is uh, where you have already sort of a router in your cable modem. Like this cable modem has the ability to be set up as a router and has four uh, ports here in this case. So uh, you plug your own router into the cable modem and the uh, Raspberry Pi, you plug that into a cable modem. Uh, now you kind of have two routers. Now this can lead uh, to a multiple NAT. Uh, I have seen, uh, actually just yesterday, uh, someone told me that uh, their DSL router, uh, in addition to the normal bridge mode, uh, has sort of a hybrid mode where you basically can set up a bridge uh, to, uh, the, uh, to your modem and get one IP address and one public IP address, then a second bridge sort of to the Raspberry Pi and get a second public IP address. So he actually got uh, two uh, public IP address, which was kind of nice. Uh, haven't seen that a lot, uh, but yeah, check with your modem configuration. Uh, reconfiguring your modem, you sometimes need, of course, the password for the modem from your ISP. Some ISPs I've seen, they sort of have a web interface, so you log into your into the ISP's website and you can make some changes there that are then being pushed to your modem. All depends a little bit. Uh, I'm going to set up some web pages, part of our GitHub repository with sort of different routers, different ISPs, uh, how they allow you to configure it. And uh, if you have any configuration we don't cover there, uh, please uh, let me know and uh, I'll add it there. Uh, that's uh, certainly helpful for others then to, to know and not have to go through that same process. And just, um, I picked a D-Link interface because that was easily found that. D-Link calls it a DMC, Demilarized Zone. And all it is, it's, it's not really a Demilarized Zone. Uh, it's just exposing that one internal IP address to all inbound traffic. That's really what it does. Um, now, on the honeypot itself, we use firewalling. Uh, but we actually don't block anything. Now, um, the honeypot, of course, is Linux based, so we're dealing with IP tables here. These are the three tables that we're using in IP tables. Pre routing, pre routing is classically used for NAT and things like this. Now, we're using it for two things. We're using it actually for logging. Uh, we log in the pre routing table. It's a little bit unusual, uh, but the reason we do that is we want to log the destination port before we redirect it to Kauri and such. So uh, that's why we log there. And then of course the redirection, we don't do NAT per se, but we redirect ports. So an inbound packet on port 22 will be redirected to port 2222, which is where our um, where Kauri is listening on. And similar for Telnet, uh, similar uh, for HTTP, for web. Now input, we do not restrict a lot. It's a honeypot after all, we want inbound connections, but we do restrict access to the administrative port SSH. 
After you install the Honeypot, SH will listen on port 12222, so one and then two times the four. First of all, of course, we have to sort of free up port 22, which is uh, now used by Kauri. Then also make it a little bit safer to sort of move it out of uh, the target uh, port range here. Uh, and we also restrict access to the port with a firewall to your internal network. During uh, the setup process, uh, you can whitelist uh, certain IP addresses. So if you have a certain administrative IP addresses, uh, you can add them to the list. By default, it will just pick your local network. Yeah, output, we don't restrict output from the honeypot. So Kauri can download uh, malware and things like this. Uh, we do allow that and uh, no restrictions on this. So for firewall logs, um, actually as part of the logging, uh, we are not accepting logs that uh, come from non-routable sources. If your honeypot is behind NAT, then the destination IP being reported back to us will be your local uh, IP address, not your public IP address. Helps a little bit with anonymity there as well. Um, we don't log broadcast, multicast traffic just because it's, it's local by its nature and that's not what we're interested in. Currently, we do log ICMP. That's probably going to go away because we don't import it on the server end. Uh, there's not much value in it. The volume is just too large. That's why we sort of uh, turn that off. And yeah, and we do log before the redirect. Now, we do set up our syslog to log all the firewall logs to this var log, the shield.log. By default, it's often logged like the standard messages log, but we want to keep it separate, makes things a little bit easier uh, for us to parse out. And then, you know, twice an hour, a script will read that log and send it off to us. You know, so that's how uh, the firewall logs are being uh, reported. Kauri, uh, the uh, SH Talent Honeypot, it, ha it has its own DShield reporting engine actually built in. So uh, we just use that. Uh, we do a little bit uh, customization to make kind of fingerprinting of it a little bit more difficult. Uh, but um, then again, you know, it is a honeypot. It's not that hard for an attacker to figure out that they're dealing with a honeypot. Some people have reported that after a while they see less attacks against their honeypot because apparently the bad guys are learning that it's a honeypot. Uh, fine with me if there are less attacks. Um, probably uh, you'll kind of like that too. Web logs, that's really the weak part of our honeypot right now. We have a custom Python script that's still very much work in progress. Right now the logs are written uh, to a little SQLite database. It makes it a bit easier uh, on the reporting end and such. But this is the part uh, where we are probably going to do the most changes uh, in sort of the next uh, few uh, months, how this exactly works. I mentioned fingerprinting of honeypots. Ultimately, not much we can do about it. Uh, we do watch out for what attackers are doing in order uh, to uh, fingerprint honeypots and sort of make adjustments to our configuration as we come across uh, some method that we can prevent easily. Uh, but yes, it's a little bit whack them all where uh, we cannot prevent all of this. If you run into any problems with the honeypot, here are a couple of URLs to ask for help. Slack works really well. If you just have an outright bug you want to report, uh, then GitHub um, is probably the best way to, to report any of that. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about how to do the actual install. So the first thing you'll need to do is you'll need to install the Raspberry Pi OS on uh, your uh, Raspberry Pi. On Ubuntu, you would just install basic Ubuntu 2004 LTS server. A desktop will work. On the Raspberry Pi, I do recommend you're using the Raspberry Pi OS Lite. Desktop will work too, uh, but there's no need for it. You know, Lite is really all you need. Uh, so you pretty much follow the Raspberry Pi instructions here in writing uh, these uh, little uh, SD cards. One little trick uh, that I don't really see well documented on the Raspberry Pi side, but if you are, once you wrote uh, the, the Raspberry Pi OS uh, to the card and you don't have keyboard and monitor connected uh, to uh, the Raspberry Pi, 
uh, you want to make sure that SSH is started up. And uh, to do that, and I'm here on a Mac, the Raspberry Pi OS writes two partitions uh, to your SD card. One, the boot partition is MS-DOS formatted, so you should be available uh, to uh, mount it in pretty much any operating system. And then all you do is uh, you create an empty file called SSH. Once you create that file SSH, uh, then uh, the SSH server will be enabled by default. Careful! Default username is pi, default password is raspberry. So um, yes, uh, by default, uh, it has default password. So first thing you do when you log in is change the password. And actually our software that installs the, uh, the honeypot will not allow you to install the honeypot if you still have the default password. Uh, it'll alert you about that. Uh, but before you expose uh, the honeypot, Please change the password. This is a very common scan for a password, as you'll later see when you install uh, the Kauri Honeypot. Uh, so uh, yes, but uh, that allows you to just SSH in uh, to uh, the Honeypot. Now, a couple other things. Uh, let me just SSH here uh, to my Honeypot. Double check the date. Uh, the date is often very far off on these Raspberry Pis. They don't have a battery to sort of uh, maintain a clock between reboots. Yes, they run NTP in the more recent versions, but before you do anything, um, set up uh, the, the date uh, to be reasonably uh, correct. Doesn't have to be totally exact, but if it's too far off, uh, then updates and so will not work because it thinks like you know, the updates are in the future and such. So. Uh, that won't work. Now, to set up the honeypot, I recommend that uh, you follow the instructions we set up for Tech Tuesday. Uh, the easiest way for these instructions is isc.sans.edu slash Tech Tuesday, and that gets you uh, to the instructions. So, a couple of things here. Let me walk you uh, through some of these steps. Let me just uh, zoom in here a little bit. So first, as I mentioned, install the operating system. And then we need Git. On Ubuntu, Git is installed by default. Raspberry Pi OS, it's usually not installed by default. So uh, that's why you want to install it. At least on the light one, it's not installed. And then you clone our Git repository. That's really all the code. The next step is somewhat optional, but it makes things a little bit smoother. This prep.sh script will install a bunch of prerequisites. Ignore any errors and warnings uh, that come from it. Let me know if, if you see any errors and such, but uh, all it does is it installs some dependencies that the install script later will install as well. But um, by doing this ahead of time, then the install script, which is more interactive, uh, will go a little bit faster. The next thing you need is uh, you need an API key. To get your API key, you log in at the Internet Storm Center website. You go to my account. And this will give you your API key. If for whatever reason there's no API key, then just reset it. If you expose the API key to the public by, for example, recording a video with it, reset your key to create a new key. Your user ID, you don't really need that. Uh, you will also need the email address that you use uh, to actually log in. So the email address and the API key is what authenticates you and uh, the install will ask for that. So, anyway, so keep that in mind. And that's sort of uh, the initial preparation phase. Uh, next, Go to exercise two here. And again, that's from our Tech Tuesday. Exercise two will walk you through the rest of the install. It should be pretty easy. So first of all, do a reboot. Yeah, before you do your install, uh, the prep.sh script will also update your honeypot and do a couple other things like that, update your operating system. And then you just run the installer. 
the installer will walk you through the install part of uh, the honeypot and it will ask you about things like you know, the API key for example your network configuration for the most part you will be able to just accept the defaults we try to pre-fill everything with reasonable values uh, to make that as easy as possible after you're done reboot reboot the honeypot that will now start up uh, the Kauri software and such and then finally and you can run this um, um, at various uh, whenever you feel like it uh, that status uh, dot sh and uh, let me go back here to my honeypot so the shield pin that's where you find all of uh, these little scripts and uh, then you have to run it with sudo because it needs access to the honeypot uh, credentials then when you do status.sh it will do a couple of sort of sanity checks here uh, common problems the shield.log the shield.log is the firewall log when you just set up your honeypot there's a chance that log does not exist yet uh, so if you get an error here wait five minutes ten minutes and then you should have something the web server exposed if you get an error here that means your honeypot is not exposed to the internet now there's a chance that if you have another web server on in your network that it will respond so you sometimes get some false positives here where it says the web server is exposed but it's not the honeypot's web server so trying to make that a little bit more specific uh, but those are probably the most common errors if you get a missing file here for cowrie.cfg rerun the install but uh, for the most part um, let me know if that happened that should never happen it usually means something is wrong uh, something's wrong with the install script and that's sort of a you probably want to uh, ask for help if if that happens uh, now anyway um, let me go back uh, to a couple other things here so in the slash server directory uh, that's where you find Kauri that's where you find the web server honeypot uh, that's for the shield logs and such uh, you see all of these files these Kauri and www with a date uh, whenever you, the honeypot is updated it copies the old versions here if something goes wrong you can just copy them back and uh, and sort of recover uh, that way also here in the log directory and I'm gonna need to be root here let me cheat uh, here are install logs if you run into problems it's helpful if you send me the install log but um, be aware there are some API keys such in there um, you may want to obfuscate them uh, I don't think there's anything but basically just look at it and see if there's anything in there you don't want me to see uh, but it's really just the output of the install script uh, that you have here uh, so um, send it as an email don't post it uh, to like a public site like uh, github or such the complete install log at least not without uh, obfuscating things but you can just look for errors and such in that log and uh, and send me those lines that sometimes suffices too so anyway that's kind of it uh, now how do you update uh, the honeypot it actually schedules a cron job to update itself it will also reboot once a day um, automatically but uh, if you do want to manually update the honeypot uh, you can just do a git pull uh, to see if there's any updates and yep, there was here a little update to the update as a sh script uh, and um, now if you run the update.sh script it will also do a git pull but only if there's an actual major new version available so if you run this oops, sorry with sudo of course it tells you here okay you know, uh, the no update required uh, uh, the current version is still version 72 and um, so nothing happens here if you do want to update it if you don't want to force an update or reinstall then install sh dash dash update uh, that will uh, run the update uh, install everything again 
Uh, that's also kind of useful as a cleanup if you think you messed something up, you edit on some files, and um, it should be non-interactive. It should not prompt you for anything. It just reads your configuration from the existing configuration file. By the way, if you are looking uh, for uh, the configuration, this also updates your operating system again, updates all the Python packages. So uh, this can take a little bit of time to run depending on network connection speed and, and, and speed of your system. I've had some reports uh, where people with uh, Raspberry Pi 2s uh, had uh, that's of initial update and so uh, take very long, literally like hours. Uh, so that uh, is something that um, you may want to keep in mind. Just leave, leave it run. Here this is now on uh, Raspberry Pi 3 I believe. Uh, and doesn't take awfully long, but sort of 15 minutes, maybe half an hour. You know, I wouldn't be too concerned if it takes that long. So anyway, just going back here uh, to exercise two. So it talks about um, the uh, status.sh file. And then uh, remember uh, to update. You can update or force an update via git. Uh, or just the normal update script, which will only update if there is like a major new version available. Uh, so with the git pull, you may get some sort of the beta versions uh, as well. And then remember uh, here again uh, to get help. Hmm? Uh, probably the ISC, the Shield Slack channel is uh, the best and quickest way uh, to usually uh, get help uh, if, if you're under any problems. Well, that's how uh, to uh, set up a honeypot, how to contribute the data. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, let me know. And uh, here's also uh, my email address again. Thanks and hope to see your data soon.